Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to an ISTBS digital event series. This is the fifth one we're having this year. Um, I'm here to introduce to you our host for today, Dr. Bohemir uh, Jelinek. He is a part of CAVS, which is Center for uh, Advanced Vehicle Systems. Uh, a part of Mississippi State University. He himself is an expert in uh, modeling and simulation. Um, he's a physicist, so best uh, the best person to be the host for this session. So uh, join me as we welcome him and kick off this session for today. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you are with us today attending our ISTVS digital event. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Christopher Goodin, who is also my esteemed colleague, fellow physicist and HPC developer. We are both privileged to work at the Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems at Mississippi State University. I first met Chris in Vicksburg, Mississippi, where he worked as a research scientist at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, AirDEC. During our lunches, together with other co-workers, we in enjoyed talking about hobbies, current local and global news, vehicle simulations, and stories from field tests. Dr. Goodin earned his PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University in 2008. As I mentioned, he worked with AirDEC for almost a decade, developing physics-based simulations of ground vehicles, sensors, and robotics, and served as the lead developer for the virtual autonomous navigation environment, WAY and the computational research and engineering acquisition tools and environments for ground vehicles, Create GV. For his research accomplishments, he received multiple honors and awards, including AirDEC Hebert Vogel Scientist Award in 2015 and the De Department of the Army Superior Civilian Service Award in 2016. In 2017, Dr. Goodin joined the Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems at Mississippi State University where he became a research faculty member, currently in the position of associate research professor. Chris specializes in the study of autonomous ground vehicles. He is the lead developer of the Mississippi State University, University Autonomous Vehicle Simulator, MAVS, which is a simulation library for autonomous ground vehicles, and the Nature Off-Road Autonomy Software Stack. Dr. Goodin made MAVS freely available for academic and non-commercial use. It is a very well-documented tool that is used in the classroom by graduate students and by researchers around the world. Dr. Christopher Goodin published his work in numerous scientific journals. His research interests are in simulations of autonomous ground vehicles, supercomputing, parallel rendering, physics-based LiDAR simulations, tire soil interactions, and terrain impact of mobility. Chris, welcome, and let's hear about maths. Uh, great. Thank you, Bomer. And um, I'm excited to be able to talk with everyone today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and so we can look at these slides. Yes, I'm going to talk today um, about the, the MSU Autonomous Vehicle Simulator, which is the, the simulator that I've been working on since uh, I started at, at Mississippi State back in in uh, November of 2017. And I'm really going to talk about that in sort of in the context of, um, of, of the larger field of study of off-road autonomy and, and how MAPS fits into that and kind of the problems that we're trying to address at, at CAVS and with the, the simulator with respect to off-road autonomy. So uh, most of this group is probably uh, somewhat familiar with off-road autonomy and the challenges that, that go with that, but I just want to talk about that for a second to sort of set the stage. So, uh, you know, you see, seeing the three pictures here, uh, all the way on the, on the left, you have uh, a picture of a turtle bot in a laboratory. And um, for, for many undergraduate and graduate students um, and, and many researchers uh, in, the, in the field of, of autonomy, and uh, you know, self-driving. A lot of the work really gets done done there um, with 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 turtlebot or small robots, and and maybe studying some very specific aspect of path planning um, or or sensing or perception at a uh, you know maybe at a, at a very academic level. 
And that sort of requires one set of tools uh, for, for simulating and, and understanding what's happening there. Um, and I'm sort of a, another higher level of complexity is something like on-road autonomy. And I have here a picture of a Tesla and uh, because that's sort of the most well-known um, you know, self-driving vehicle out there today. Although, uh, if you were to consult the, the you know, the Tesla uh, user, user documentation, um, they would tell you that, that the Tesla is not autonomous. It is a, a driver assist, uh, func functions, but, uh, in reality, it, it can drive itself in certain situations and Tesla users, um, will understand that. Um, and then sort of the next level of complexity or the highest level of complexity, I would say, and the problem that I've been interested in for my career is off-road self-driving vehicles. And I'm um, going back to my, my the beginning of my career with um, the, the U.S. Army Erdic. Um, really, the context that I've studied that in the most is in the context of, of Department of Defense and Army um, off-road autonomy um, and the obvious reasons that the Army would be interested in being able to to take autonomous vehicles off road that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so, uh, of course, you know, with, with, uh, with going off road, there's a, there's the, the added challenge of, of dealing with soil rather than paved and engineered surfaces and, and rough surfaces and all those things that are traditional terra mechanics problems. But there's a lot of other things that go along with that as well. And so just to kind of set the stage for, for the things that are really interesting from a, a simulation of off-road autonomy perspective, I want to just take a, a second to um, go over the way I kind of have learned to think about the components of, of an off-road autonomous system, system and how they work together. So you have sensing, which is your cameras, your LIDAR, your, your radar, your GPS, inertial measurement units, all of those pieces of hardware that that you would take and, and put on a vehicle that allow it to to collect uh, measurements of of the terrain and the world around it. And in this video, what you see in the in the top right panel, this is on our proving ground uh, off road proving ground area at the Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems in Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, and this and the vehicle that you see is a as an M Razor D4, um, which uh, we uh, purchased uh, for a project that we were doing with Erdic at the time and and retrofitted to be self-driving. So we took that M-Razor and equipped it with the sensing that we needed um, and then also the, the drive-by wire kit that we needed to actuate the throttle and steering, which, which I'll talk, get to in a second. But but the sensing, uh, you know, in the way that I view um, sort of the breakdown of these components is primarily a hardware problem. Um, so, I, I, you know, if you think about a camera or a LIDAR, but let's just say for uh, for the purposes of, of this conversation, we're talking about a camera. You have a raw, let's say you have a raw image uh, stream that's coming from a camera or maybe a video stream. Well, those images in and of themselves don't really tell you anything that you need to know uh, to be able to navigate autonomously. They have to be processed and information has to be extracted from those images. And that's a software process primarily. And so that's when I say perception, that's what I'm really referring to is that process of taking the raw sensor data and extracting usable information about the terrain um, in real time as you're driving in, in order to do then the next step, which is planning. So that's um, maybe you have planning, of course, can be broken down into multiple stages. Maybe you have a, a mission, which is a very high level plan. And then you have a, you know, a, a, uh, a sort of a global plan, which is, you know, your maybe your your end goal point. And then in between there, you, you may have much more sort of local planning kind of functions, which are, you know, how do I go around uh, this this obstacle here in my immediate path or 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 up this hill or those kind of things. Then you have the control problem, which is you have a you have a path that you want to follow. How do I actuate the throttle, steering, braking? And whatever other components I might have on the vehicle to actually follow that path safely. And then finally, you have action, which is back to a hardware level. And that is the, the servo motors or the electric motors that are, that are actually uh, engaging the throttle and steering and brake. And so I really, for the most part, although the lines do tend to blur somewhat uh, between these components, for the most part, I think of sensing and action as, as hardware. 
and it takes place in hardware on a self-driving vehicle and the perception planning and control typically are, are in, are in software. Now, there are certain sensors, of course, like uh, radar, for example, automotive radar, where the sensing and perception are, are very tightly coupled. And, 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 and there are certain, of course, autonomy functions um, uh, like modular predictive control, for example, where the planning and the control are very tightly coupled. So these things can be can be mashed together in certain ways. But I would I would say that for the most part, this is a very useful way to think about um, self-driving and autonomous vehicles, especially in in the off-road context. And, and just to explain a little bit more of this, this video that you've seen over and over now, you see the, the colorized light or point cloud in the, in the left um, window there. And so that's a, the colorizing that point cloud is sort of one sort of base layer of perception. It's combining two different sensors and creating, putting things into the world that helps you see this world model cohesively. Of course, there's many, there's many different steps to it. Um, but one of the things that, that I've been very engaged in over the course of my career is off-road autonomy testing. So when we have an off-road autonomy system that has those five components that I just talked about it, we can test in a lot of ways. So we can, we can test those individual functions, um, individually, uh, or we can, we can test the entire system, um, in sort of a, a basic level test. And what you see here is a, is a test of obstacle detection and avoidance in an off-road scenario. Again, this is, this is in our, in our off-road proving, uh, ground, uh, area at, at CAVS. And you see the same M-Razor vehicle. And if you watch the video uh, closely here, you'll see that, that the person in the driver's seat, uh, which who's my boss, Dr. Daniel Carruth, uh, is, doesn't have hands on the wheel. So this vehicle is, is driving autonomously. And we did a series of, of tests to evaluate an autonomy stack um, like this. And, and one of the things that um, I can tell you from, from having been involved in these tests um, is that the, the process of field testing, as we all sort of know, uh, you're, you are, um, you're sort of beholden to, uh, the elements, right? Uh, you may want, you may not want to test, uh, do soft soil testing, but if it rains, then, then all of a sudden you're going from, from doing this nice, uh, fairly trafficable soil to, to soft soil, or maybe you have equipment that you can't get rained on. And so, there's these challenges associated with it, and I and I don't think I need to necessarily to this group justify why we need simulation, um, but that is one of the many reasons um, that that having a, a simulator for off-road autonomous vehicles is really really useful. And so that's just to kind of set up the the problem space that the the MSU autonomous vehicle simulator that I'm going to talk about today uh, is sort of built to address, which is um, at, at CAVS, we, we are both developers of, of autonomy in the various, uh, the different pieces of those, of those five components of autonomy that I showed, perception, planning, and control. Uh, and we also are testers of autonomy. So we work, um, with partners at the Ground Vehicle Systems Center and the U.S. Army Erdic, uh, and other places to test autonomous systems. And we've thought a lot about um, the right way to do that, that testing in a way that really reveals something useful about your autonomous system. And so those are the kind of two areas that I really wanted MAVS to be able to address. Um, so if you think about it on the front end, we have sort of the development of those algorithms and those individual pieces. And that's a very sort of re basic research question a lot of times. And on the, the back end, you have maybe a testing of those, of the integration of those pieces or how those that autonomy stack performs doing a certain task. And that's kind of at the end of the development and of more mature technologies usually. And we wanted a tool that could kind of address both of those. And so um, as Boromir mentioned, when I, when I was with the, the, the URDIC uh, working for the U.S. Army, uh, I had a lot of experience in this area. And so when I started development of the, the MAVs, I kind of had in my brain some, some things that I, some features that I wanted MAVs to have. And you see those listed here. So it is a, it's a software library. So it's, uh, it's not an application that you're going to necessarily open up out of the box and start, uh, you know, start running, running simulations. Um, it's, it's a, it's a composable library that allows you to piece together, um, the terrain and the environment and the vehicle and the sensors 
and connect that to, if you want to, to an autonomy algorithm um, using either the Python API or the C++ API and, and very, very um, customizable and compose your simulation. It is cross-platform. Um, so uh, one of the things was, that was always a pet peeve of mine uh, as, a, as a user of simulation tools was when I found some great tool and, and I couldn't run it on, on Linux or I couldn't run it on Windows. And so MAMS is, is uh, a cross-platform and very easy to build and use on, a, on any operating system. And it's been tested on Mac, various flavors of Linux and Windows. Um, ROS2 and uh, ROS1 and 2 compatibility um, was another feature that I knew that was going to be really important. And then HPC compatibility. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we use MAPS with HPC in a minute. Um, but uh, HPC compatibility was an important one because of the way that we intended to use MAPS and have used MAPS for testing. Um, because HPC really enables us to do some of the testing that we're interested in. And then uh, easy to install and use. And this was one was really important to me because um, I wanted it to be something that students could use, and I'll show in in a little while the way that uh, several students have been have been using maps. But I didn't want this to be prohibitive, prohibitively difficult to to get up and running. And I think it is actually pretty easy to get up and running. And I'll talk about that. And then lastly, I did want to make this open source. Now, uh, ultimately, what we said along with maps is that it's not uh, it, it's free for non-commercial use. So we for commercial users who intend to use maps to develop uh, a product, um, we, we do have licensing options set up, uh, but, but it's free for non-commercial use. So that's any academic research uh, or government research. And it is open source, even for commercial users. Once they have that license agreement, they have full access to the source code. So, you know, those, those bullets there, I, you'll notice I really haven't said anything about the technical sort of aspects of what MAPS does. This was just the bigger picture things that, that I wanted MAPS, the features that I wanted it to have from, from the perspective of, of the software package in general. And, and so um, we started making MAPS available to the public in, in 2018. Since that time, it's, it's uh, really grown in terms of, of the number of users around the world. You see a you know, map here of, of different uh, people that have requested and been given access to MAPS. And this is not a, a comprehensive list of all the different organizations and universities in terms of the, the different icons that you see here, because I've started to run out of room on this slide. But um, but you see, there's a pretty good representation of different academic and government uh, government institutions using maps. Um, I do not have uh, our commercial users in here, but we do have a number of commercial users of maps. And so as, as the number of users has grown, um, so too has the way that we support and, and provide documentation and those kinds of things to get, to get maps up and for people to get maps up and running. And so another great thing about maps is that there is a lot of online documentation available um, to help people. So, um, that's kind of a, an introduction to, to why maps was created and, uh, just sort of big picture of the role that, um, I'm trying to have maps fill within the off-road autonomy community. And what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is um, not too deeply, but at a little bit deeper level, go into the, the different uh, simulation components of MAVS and, uh, and how it simulates the different aspects of off-road autonomy. And, um, and get into some of, some of those things. So, um, the, the sensor and environment physics uh, in MAPS, you can you can see here a list of the uh, different environmental com conditions that MAPS will do: uh, rain, snow, dust, uh, fog, and we're we have a couple of ongoing projects um, that are improving and, and enhancing aspects of of, of uh, the snow uh, part of that, especially. But what I've done is is essentially take uh, what I consider to be the best um, sort of published uh, models for how how LIDAR, cameras, uh, radar interact with these different weather phenomena and implement those in maps. And, um, and one of the great things about uh, sort of having an open source and very open architecture is that it's, it's fairly easy to add in new environmental features and how they affect um, the way that the LIDAR may return off of those or not return or noise that's introduced. 
uh, range degradation, all those kinds of things. Um, Mavs uses um, path tracing to do rendering. So we can do very high fidelity rendering that basically solves the, you know, the full, uh, full rendering equation. Um, you see the, the pictures on the left and right here are kind of your sort of stereotypical, uh, if you wanted to show off a rendering engine kind of pictures. And these were generated with Mavs. And so Mavs at its core is a, is a high fidelity. It has a high fidelity rendering engine, um, that, that you can access and use. And then we can just apply that to these off-road, off-road scenarios and situations uh, to create photorealistic images uh, if you want to. Now, the photorealistic rendering, oftentimes, if you have a very complex scene, is not going to run in real time. And so we have a couple of different rendering options that you'll see over the course of the presentation. Um, but uh, the, the physics uh, that I show this just to say that the, the, the level of physics that is embedded in maps um, really is, is pretty high. So we also have a fairly sophisticated LIDAR simulation that uh, takes into account the, the, the beam width and how you get to scattering and mixed pixels as you return off of, of vegetation. Um, we have a mass is a fully spectral uh, ray tracing simulation. So what that means is that if you have a LIDAR that's operating, let's say at 905 nanometers, which is near infrared, uh, a typical simulator, the environment is not going to be attributed uh, at 905 nanometers. So the reflectance properties of, of vegetation, for example, uh, is pretty unique in that vegetation has a fairly low reflectance in the red band. So if you think about RGB, which is the way every simulator is attributed pretty much if, if it's built on a game engine like Unreal or Unity, the simulators are attributed in the RGB. And uh, LiDAR doesn't operate in those bands, it operates in near infrared. And so we can actually attribute the vegetation, which happens to be very reflective in the near infrared, even though it uh, has low reflectivity in the red. And so those kind of features uh, in a real autonomous system can be used to distinguish vegetation. And, uh, and so you can, you can do that with maps by really encoding extra information onto the scene attributes um and constructing really complex scenes so the the pictures in the bottom right here uh is uh just a uh the, the left one is an image of a of kind of a, a terrain feature in our on our proving ground and, and the right one is our recreation of that train feature in maps for the purposes of, of doing uh, doing testing and you can see the kind of level of fidelity that we're we're able to get um with the map simulation now, I wanted to show this video in terms of, of LiDAR operating in dense vegetation. I, I got, I was sent this video uh, by Kasi uh, Biswant from uh, Texas A&M University, who is one of my, my MAV users. And I thought this was really cool uh, because <clears throat> uh, when, when I, when I have done simulations in, in dense vegetation, I really have never made it this dense, but, but, uh, Kasi was interested in studying. You can see sort of some obstacles hidden in the grass here. If you look at the, the, the top left window and uh, he's he's studying ways to detect those in the LIDAR signature. And uh, MAVS allows you to generate those really realistic LIDAR signatures in vegetation and actually study that. And I, I thought this was one of the cooler demonstrations that I've seen. So I asked Kasi if I could include this this video. Now you, you do see that the frame rate when you put this much vegetation does start to slow down a bit. But if you're studying perception and you want to generate this kind of data, um, you know, it's really useful to have a, a simulator um, that can that can actually generate uh, the point clouds that you want to study um, without necessarily having to go out and find a test area and put the put the obstacles that you want to look for out there and and those kinds of things. So. Again, I think everybody listening probably understands why we want to use simulation to do some of these things. But I thought that um, that this particular use case was 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 a really neat application of what maps can do. And if you're familiar with ROS, you 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 know that this the window to the right here is the the uh, built-in visualization system uh, that comes with ROS called RBIS. And so this also kind of shows off the way that maps is. is can be very tightly integrated with ROS. And that was a feature that I thought was really important for serving the, 
the autonomy and unmanned vehicle community and has gotten a lot of use um, with maps to be able to just spin up a map simulation and, and dump the data straight into it to Ross. I will mention with that, uh, that there are the interfaces with Ross, um, are in separate uh, repos on GitHub. So those are publicly available. And so you, you build maps in your system and then you install the, the maps ROS or maps ROS2 as a as a ROS package, just like you would any other ROS package. And then you're you're up and running. It's a pretty seamless process. Um, so this just gets a little bit more into the, the sensor environment interaction. And it's this video on the left here showing some of the different uh, environmental um, things that maps can simulate. I've sort of already talked about a lot of this, but um, I just throw this up here to say that we've published a lot of, of the models that we have, have integrated into maps in terms of the weather and, and uh, how they affect the sensors. So those are out there and you can either look in the documentation and, and see references to the models that we've implemented or go find go find those references um, if you want to know more about it. Now, um, before I get too much into the vehicle environment um, physics, this is probably the portion that, in terms of chair mechanics, that is the most relevant. And um, and I'll just uh, introduce this by saying MAPS has basically a, a couple of different options for, for how you can implement vehicle physics. Um, but one of the, the features of the software architecture of MAPS is that you can actually swap in any rendering engine that you want to use or any physics engine that you want it to use. So I... I, I, it was really important to me in developing maps that that I maintain modularity, meaning uh, if you were to compare maps to a game engine, um, one of the things that me that that makes a game engine useful is that the physics and the rendering are tightly coupled so that you don't have to think too hard about uh, when I put, um, you know, uh, an object into my virtual world uh, about embedding the physics and the visualization as separately. MAVS just takes a, a different approach, which, which is that the, the vehicle or the, the, the environment physics and the environment rendering and visualization are loosely coupled. And that is a, a, a deliberate decision to make it possible to pull out one physics engine and put in another uh, pretty easily. Now, there are some consequences to that, which is, um, as a user, when you're composing, especially when you're creating a scene or environment that you want to test in, you have to put in a little more thought to how you want the physics and the visualization or sensor simulation to be coupled. So that becomes a responsibility of the user now, but it does allow you to have a lot more flexibility. Um, I didn't really talk about this, but MAPS actually has multiple rendering options that you can use, and it has multiple vehicle physics options that you can use. Um, so, uh, and, and you can add more uh, if you had some other physics engine that you wanted to use um, through a pretty simple a, uh, C++ API, you can put additional or different physics in there. Um, the default physics that sort of comes uh, out of the box with NAVs in terms of this is what you'll get if you just use the default vehicles is, is uh, built on React Physics 3D, which is a game engine kind of physics, um, very similar to what you might see in ODE or some of the other um, sort of game engine kind of physics engines that you can get out there. It's an open source physics engine. And the vehicle physics is pretty, pretty simple. Um, every suspension element is treated as a linear, linear spring damper. Um, the, the, you can put as many different suspension elements as you want on a vehicle, but they're all going to be independent linear spring dampers. The tire is treated as a, as a linear spring damper system. I'll show some more about that in a second. The vehicle body is basically just treated as, as a, a cuboid. And so the inertia and all properties of that are, are, are all pretty simple. And you can read more about that uh, on, the, on the documentation. I get the link to that here. And, uh, I, you know, I have this as the default option sort of with the, with the full understanding that that may be more simplistic if you're really interested in the dynamics than you want to use. Um, and so I also have the hooks in here. And I, and I understand that you all had a, a presentation about Chrono as, as the last um as the last one of these meetings. And I'm a, I've been a big Chrono fan for a long time. So when I was was at the at the US Army Erdic and I was the lead developer on Create GV um, about that's been almost 10 years ago now, I made the, you know, I, I made the decision that, that Chrono was going to be the kind of the backbone dynamics engine of, of Create GV. And so I also went ahead and put the hooks in Mavs to if you wanted to use 
math rendering and math sensor simulation, um, but you wanted to incorporate the Corona vehicle dynamics uh, engine, um, you could do that. So MAVS has built into it, has the hooks to connect to Chrono, uh, but you could, like I said, you could really implement um, any vehicle dynamics that you wanted to or physics package. Now, the reason I have the more the option to do the more simplistic um, vehicle dynamics is it's really about the user, right? So a lot of the users of MAVS um, are, are graduate students or even undergraduate students who Maybe they're not interested. Maybe they're really studying for their for their thesis or their dissertation, um, uh, like some aspect of, of processing LIDAR or processing images. And they're not an expert on vehicle dynamics. And uh, so for them, they just want a, a dynamics package that really doesn't require them to, to know a whole lot about of information about. Um, the geometry of the different suspension elements of their vehicle. So they can create this vehicle pretty quickly, get up and running in a few hours and start generating the data that they want to generate. And, and it actually has been the case that I would say the majority of my users, the sort of the default vehicle dynamics is enough, good enough for what they want to do. But it's really nice to know that, that you have this option to do something more sophisticated if you want to. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention this um, because since this is the uh, the ISTVIS meeting, um, I was really excited to be able to incorporate um, the equations from that, that, that Dr. George Mason and his collaborators at, at Erdick and uh, MSU, uh, uh, namely Dr. Fahita Fard and Dr. Jody Purdy at, at Erdick. They have been working on this drug database for a number of years now, which is really um, sort of compiling a huge database of, of field and laboratory measurements for uh, for tractive force versus slip for, for a variety of different um, soil conditions and tires and um, using uh, different machine learning methods and other um, uh, methods to to come up with with new equations for for net traction and and motion resistance. Um, for wheel vehicles. And so what I've done is take those equations and embed them directly into MAVS. So MAVS has um, a couple of different options for, for tire terrain physics. Um, one of the most widely used um, uh, sort of equations for, um, for on-road or hard surface tire physics is the Pajeka model. So you have that model is, is built into MAVS. And if you're doing on-road or hard surface, you can use this sort of the defaults there. But if you're doing either coarse grain soil or, uh, or fine grain soil, you have the option to use these um, equations that have been published by, uh, by Dr. Mason and his collaborators in the, in the Drove database um, publications. And and I have done validation tests in MAPS to ensure that those are implemented correctly in terms of reproducing things like VCI1 and, and uh, things like that. And the, it will grab the, the, the parameters of the tire uh, that you put in in your input file and the, the terrain uh, properties that you specify and give you realistic results for net traction. Um, the tire model, which you kind of in the previous video you saw, it was really demonstrating the tire model. Uh, it's just a radial spring uh, tire model, but what I've done is I've made it 3D uh, by adding uh, slices of the tire going across and then adding, adding a, you know, a lateral, uh, the, the lateral component to the motion, uh, to, excuse me, to the, to the traction um, using um, kind, of, kind of a standard ellipsoidal uh, traction model um, to, to take those equations like from, from the, the drove database that are basically for longitudinal traction and and get the full 3D uh, uh, traction from there. Okay, now that's all the physics in in the uh, 15 or 16 years that I've been doing the the simulations for for autonomous vehicles. Though uh, I will say that what I've learned is that the usually the the bottleneck in terms of workflow is actually creating the digital terrains. So, and, and the, the interesting thing about that is that it really doesn't matter how good your, your physics are in terms of your sensor physics, your environment physics, your, your vehicle physics, your, your terrain, tire terrain interaction physics, all of those can be great. 
And if you don't have a digital scene that has the attributes to support those models, it really doesn't matter. So, so the, the digital scene generation process and attributing that scene, um, really becomes, um, one of the most important factors in, in, in enabling all of those cool physics models to actually tell you interesting things about your autonomous system. So we spent a lot of time in MAVs and, and at CAVs in general thinking about digital scene generation and, and working on digital scene generation and trying to incorporate all of the aspects of digital scenes that are really relevant for off-road autonomy. And one of the things, uh, one of the things that we've done is really de develop a lot of automated tools. And I'm, I'm just going to show one of these right now. Um, so one of the ways that we use MAVs in, in testing, and I'll, and I'll show some examples of this in just a minute in the presentation. Um, one of the ways that we use MAVs in testing is to do off-road autonomy where we, um, where we do repeated tests in, in different virtual environments. So we have, maybe we have a virtual forest that we drive through, but we don't just drive this through the same one over and over. We want a, a different one. Um, we want a different one each time. And so we actually can automatically generate a new forest by, by growing it. Um, in, in the, and you see the kind of the example of that, uh, in, in the middle screen there of, of this forest growing and, trees dying off and we have lots of environmental models embedded in that about how they grow and die. And then we also have um, automated processes for, for, you know, simulating leaf, uh, you know, removal or, or basically leaf shedding over the course of seasons and things like that to, to really try to create um, realistic digital terrains. I'm going to play this video here in the bottom right one more time. Another thing we've done is, Develop uh, methods for automatically, you know, changing the colors of leaves as the as the season change and things like that. And we also have automatic ways for encoding different roughness values and slopes into the terrain, so that we can automatically do a lots of different testing without having to create different scenes by hand. Um, so I know I've been going now for close to my time. I want to show uh, quickly run through an app. One of the main applications. Um, that we've used maps for over the years, and that's the the nature autonomy stack. And, and Bowler mentioned this at the top of the uh, at the introduction. But uh, we have developed the nature autonomy stack as a as an open source, uh, free and open source stack for off road autonomy for passenger large passenger sized uh, Ackerman steered off road vehicles. And what we found, we, we developed this for an art project, Automotive Research Center. Um, and we were, we were wanting to sort of study autonomy, off-road autonomy in a very general way to, to study how air propagates through different autonomous, uh, subsystems. And we, we, we found that there wasn't really sort of an open source autonomous and navigation stack for off-road available to us at that time. And so we started developing the nature stack. Um, and, uh, basically, the, the, the nature stack um, in 2022, it got forked and, and became the foundation of the NATO autonomy stack, which has continued to develop new capability within that. Um, but I bring this up to say that we, we basically developed most of the components uh, of the stack that you see here in these little um, uh, boxes. We, de we basically developed the stack almost entirely in simulation in the first two years, and we didn't get around to to actually putting it on a vehicle and field testing it until the third year of development. And what we found in doing that was that we really got a long way uh, in developing a fully functioning autonomy stack just using the simulator. And in the, in the last year um, of that project, what we did was a campaign to, to do these obstacle detection and avoidance field tests. And you saw one at the beginning of the presentation where we were out in one of these fields here. We did a number of them on this gravel road. Uh, to, to do comparisons. That, well, first off, to answer the question that we originally asked about air propagation on autonomous systems, but then ultimately to do comparisons, the real versus simulated test. So we were able to compile. Um, if you look at this, this picture on the left here, this is a top down view of the, of the video that we just watched here of this video. So, um, the, I'll show you in a second, the, the, you'll see the obstacle and you'll see the barriers and you'll see the various trajectories that were taken over the course of the test. So these, the blue lines sort of represent the barriers 
Um, the red dot represents the obstacle. And the green kind of represents the, the, the goal area that we were trying to get to. Now, you'll appreciate that the X and Y have very different scales here, right? So the, the Y is covering about 10 meters. X is covering about 200 meters. So the, the, the lateral deviation along this trajectory is sort of exaggerated in this plot. But what you see is we're, we're able to compile, um, about, uh, about 200 different, uh, obstacle avoidant tests at different speeds. And in, in the field testing, excuse me, and what we could do is then go back and compare that to simulated testing. So in these plots, what you see, the, the, the black uh, lines are, are trajectories from the field testing. The light blue lines are trajectories from the simulated testing of those same experiments. And then the, the thick red line is sort of the average trajectory for for field testing and the thick magenta line is kind of the average trajectory for simulated testing. So we found some interesting, some things there. Um, so we did find that you see there, there's obviously some, dif some differences. Um, one of the biggest differences that we found was, um, you know, in basically how hard left the, the, the real vehicle wanted to go. But, that was another interesting case for us because you'll see here too, one of the things that really jumps out at you is that the vehicle basically always preferred to go left, the real vehicle. And there's nothing in the autonomy stack that would, would tell it, uh, when you have sort of a symmetric situation like we were testing where the, the obstacle was directly in the center of the path, there was nothing that would, in the, in the software that would cause it to prefer to go left. But what we were able to do was use the simulator and we found that by, um, very, very slight shift of the center of gravity of the vehicle to the left or a very, very slight uh, difference in inflation pressures of the tires um, on the order of a few percent for either of those um, would cause the, the autonomy stack to, to drastically favor one direction of the other, other which you wouldn't necessarily uh, think just through intuition uh, because for a human driver, when you're driving a vehicle like that, uh, very small, you know, pull to the left, you will compensate for your steering almost subconsciously. But an autonomous vehicle, uh, when there's a very, very small um, pull to the left, what we found is that the autonomy stack just, uh, instead of compensating for that, that sort of accumulates and sort of tends to force it in the same direction every time. And so we actually used the simulator to help us understand what was happening. Why was our autonomy stack always going left? So I'm going to run through these really quickly because I know we're at 50 minutes now. Um, this is one of the reasons, uh, this is a simulation where we had that nature autonomy stack and we added sort of this biological interaction layer on top of it and simulated, I think this is 12 different vehicles, um, doing a, a collaborative sort of teaming motion. And we use HPC for this because um, basically when you have the autonomy stack running, the autonomy stack is running about 10 different processes at once. So running one instance of the autonomy stack really takes a lot of compute. And then that's not even getting into the fact that when you're simulating this, now you've got to simulate all the sensors in the vehicle. So that takes this about three or four more processes running. And now when you're doing 12 of those, all of a sudden now you actually need a lot of compute to simulate um, sort of this you know, intermediate to large scale teaming operations. And that's where the HPC really comes in. So this is one way that we, that we use MAS on the HPC is if we want to do a bunch of vehicles at a time. And I will point out that, you know, this is, this is something that is really a great use case for simulation because, uh, even a relatively inexpensive vehicle like the M Ranger, by the time you put all the compute and the equipment on it, um, you're getting sort of into a cost prohibitive area for most universities if you wanted to make 10 or 12 of them. Um, and uh, with maps, you can start to learn about how might we, we implement something like this, um, where we had this, this fairly large scale team doing a, a cross country navigation with this bio inspired algorithms, uh, without actually spending the, the millions of dollars that it would take to create these. Um, this is another use case that we did for the Army where we're looking at negative obstacle detection, which is a, a challenge from the from the perception problem, perception perspective. So this is 
<clears throat> using maps to study perception, which is one of the main use cases. Um, this is one that my colleague, uh, Dr. Luther Dabaru did several years ago, um, where she used uh, maps to create labeled sensor data to study machine learning with LIDAR. So if you've ever tried to, to label, hand label, semantically label 3D LIDAR data, um, hopefully you haven't, but if you have, you know that that is really, really challenging uh, and uh, much more difficult than labeling image data. And so one of the things that maps can do for you is automatically do semantic labeling of your data, even your 3D LIDAR data. And it lets you start to study um, different machine learning methods with LIDAR in a way that it would it would take a, a huge team of people labeling LIDAR data to be able to even get you up and running where you could start studying something like that. Um, but with MAVS, the data is just there for you. Um, I already sort of oops, I already sort of talked about this idea of doing new capability development with MAVS, but this is just a couple of examples of things that we've done with MAVS. Um, on the left, you're, you, what you're seeing is a leader follower example implemented in ROS, where we have that autonomy stack that I already showed, the nature autonomy stack running on the following vehicle, which is an M-Razor. And then we have the lead vehicle being driven um, just with a keyboard. So basically kind of like a driving game, right? So I was driving it and we had in ROS, we had the lead vehicle dropping GPS waypoints. Um, that the follow vehicle was then picking up and, and following. And this is just another example of, you know, use case wise, <clears throat> just from a safety perspective, even if you were going to try to implement a, a, an experiment like that, things start to get really complicated. And so it's really nice to be able to have a simulator that allows you to do a lot of the debugging and initial implementation of that before you ever take it out and do the initial testing. Um, and, I, and I will say one one word about that as I'll let this run. Uh, one of the questions that 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 uh, if you do simulation for autonomous vehicles uh, that you will frequently get is, is about validation. Right. So how do I know that the results that I'm getting in the simulator are going to be the same that I'll get in the real world? And I will just make a, a, a two general remarks about that. And And one is that. In general, no matter what simulator you're using, the results are not going to be the same as the real world. That's why we do real world testing. Um, there, there's always going to be differences. Um, that doesn't mean that the simulation is not really, really useful. And um, the, I, I guess the, the second general remark I'll make about that is that uh, a broad case, I would say, is what we found is that if you're developing sort of any aspect of autonomy from from perception to planning to control to, to system integration. Um, if it if what you're doing is not working in your simulator, uh, if it's not working in Mavs, uh, you you really can't expect it to, to to take it out into a field test and then it's going to start working in the field. Um, there are certainly instances where you can get it working in the simulator and it still may not work in the field, but uh, simply having the simulator as that very initial uh, um, development tool to help you work out all the bugs that you can in simulation before you take it out into the field has been hugely valuable for us, as I mentioned, in developing the nature autonomy stack. In, and as I mentioned, in helping us understand our testing. So like the, the, the issue of, of the vehicle pulling left and going in and tweaking things in the simulation and saying, OK, well, really, uh, what the simulator is telling us is that uh, it's revealing something to us about our autonomy that would have been really hard to figure out just with the field testing. So there's tremendous value in, in maps and what it can do. Um, and then the other, this is my last slide. Um, <clears throat> maps has been used by one of our professors at Mississippi State, Dr. John Ball in the ECE department as a teaching tool in the class that he teaches every other semester on sensor processing for autonomous vehicles. Um, and so what he does is, is uh, let his, his students use math to, to understand how to process sensor data in a way that you would typically do in an autonomy application. And the great thing about having something like MAVS is, of course, um, with a class of 60 or 80 students, you can't give them all their own sensor, usually, or their own on autonomous vehicle to go test. But with a tool like MAVS, they basically have that um, and can understand it in a much more hands-on way than just a purely, you know, kind of theory that you might get in a class where, where you don't actually have the data to work with. So um, we've had 
probably over 200 students now use MAVS in that class. I think they've taught it three or four times now, and it's been really successful. And the great thing, too, is um, in terms of the ease of installation that I've talked about at the top, um, I always tell people, you, you, you may think your software is easy to install until um, you have, a, you know, 60 students uh, in a room on a Thursday night all trying to install it at once. And then you start to learn where the, the pain points are. And so over the years, as they've used that, uh, uh, we've steadily made it easier and easier to install now to where that's a process that can just be done in the classroom, you know, um, by a group of students. So it, it, when I say it's easy to install, I, I really have had to <laughs> have had to work on that over time and make it very easy to install. And uh, we get better at that. So with that, um, I think uh, I've shown everything I want to show. I appreciate your attention and your patience as we had a little trouble getting, getting the slides started there at the beginning. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, I would like to thank you, Chris, for uh, your very informative presentation about the vari variety of MAVS features, nature stack, and field testing ex experience. I'm sure everyone is ready to start using MAVS and its tools after your talk. Ladies and gentlemen, now I invite you to ask questions. Oh, this is a great opportunity to talk to the first developer of MAVS. You can type your questions into the chat or please let Varsha know that you prefer to speak. We already have a few questions in the chat. And uh, the first one is from Dr. Mason. The question is, can you give examples of soil input parameters and calibration for soil strength and type? Yes. So, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm using those equations from the Grove database. So that that database is basically split into fine grained and coarse grained, and so <coughs> that's the um, that's the basic soil type that you need to know. Are we dealing with fine grained or coarse grained? And then the the, the soil strength as a, as a cone index, and those are really the two, only two inputs. Now. Um, of course, as we know, there's a lot of things that go into soil strength, moisture content, those kind of things. So either you can say, um, I want to just define that soil strength across my digital terrain, or you can have some other model where if you, you know, if you have maybe some, some weather inputs and, um, you want to calculate the moisture content and then back out the soil strength, there are equations for doing that, as you know. So there's a couple of different ways to approach that, but those are the, those are the main, um, those are the main two inputs for the soil model. The second question I see from Dr. Mason here is how close is the simulation to mercury or Erdic simulator? Um, <clears throat> so uh, to my knowledge, and and uh, I was the lead de developer of mercury up until 2017, uh, so I, I, I can only speak to where it was at that time, and I, I haven't, ha you know, I, I don't necessarily know everything that's happened since. Um, um, but But to my knowledge, the... Um, the basic construction of the architecture in some ways is, is similar to Mercury in terms of the way that the, the tire terrain interaction is, is in a way is separated from the vehicle dynamics. The, the specific models that are implemented, though, uh, may be a little different um, in that I'm, I'm using the drove database models. And I, I believe that the at least at the, the time that I last looked at it, the Mercury was using the um, the VTI models that had been the same as those that had been implemented at B9. So, so, you know, slightly different implementation of those. Um, but the sort of the basic idea was similar. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Right. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, I see from Alex Keen here, where can we get online training on Mavs and what is the level of coding and computer, uh, computing skill required? Um, Varsha, am, am I allowed to uh, to drop a link into the into the chat? Yeah, yeah. If you if you if you want, you can send it to me, and it goes out as a notification. I actually sent um, a link already out about Mavs. Okay. Um, but so, if you have more links, I can I can even put it in the. Um, oh yeah, there there you okay. go. <laughs> so so that's a great question, Alex. So I mean the the. There's online user documentation is a great place to start. Uh, there's also API documentation. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll find that and drop it in the chat here in a second. The API documentation, of course, is a little more technical in terms of the, you know, the actual function calls that you'd be using and, and that kind of thing. So, um, so, and then that gets into your second question 
um, is how much coding and computer skill is required. I would say a basic, at a minimum, basic understanding of Python is required. So um, the majority of my of my users over the years that Mavs is written in C++, um, the, and there's a Python API that's on top of that. The majority of users over the years have chosen to use the Python API. Uh, I, I didn't throw any code examples in this talk, um, but I will I will say that you can get a, a simulation of a vehicle doing autonomous navigation up and running in 100 lines of Python, let's say. So it's not it's not um, prohibitive in terms of the knowledge that you need to have, but you do need to understand a little bit about Python. Um, <clears throat> There are no formal courses available right now, um, but uh, that is something we talked about doing and putting up. So there's a, you know, there's a couple different resources for getting that uh, information out there, and we talked about putting that up. So that's something we'll definitely consider doing. Um, the, uh, Alex, does that does that cover everything for you? Uh, yeah, on on that side of it. Um, uh, as you say, that, that may be something you develop. Uh, I mean, I had a quick look at YouTube to see if there was anything on there. And I don't know if you're planning to put any demos on on how to get started. You, you mentioned um, uh, a few minutes ago when you had a class, the issue mm -hmm. is of trying to get a, a, a number of students all installed at the same time. Um, whether you'd actually thought of, of, of doing a demo which could go onto YouTube or could go onto our website, if you like, uh, on our YouTube uh, channel of how to actually install and get started. Because very often that, that, that's the initial barrier for a lot of people. Once they get something up and they can run a demo, then the next thing, of course, is, oh, I'd like to be able to change this, change that. Then I'd right. like to be able to do something slightly new. So if, if there was, say, for example, a, a demo on getting started, that would really help quite a lot of us to to make the first step. Um, I, I, yeah, you're absolutely right, and uh, that's we, we have talked about it. I need to make it a priority to get that out there because you're um, you're 100 correct. And I know as a as a uh, software developer, I, I'm a frequent uh, you know YouTube how-to watcher, so I know the value of it. I just I need to uh, to get that out there for now. So we will make that a priority. Um, but thank you for that comment. So, Andres, uh, see, in terms of sensor variety and modifications of sensors, how different is math to other simulators, for example, Carla? Um, I, I have, I'm only been a cursory user of Carla, so I don't want to present myself as a Carla expert by any means. Uh, I have used it, but, but as a, you know, like I said, I, I'm not dug deep into it. Um, so I'll just answer from the perspective of, of Mavs. Um, it comes for, for like for LiDAR, it comes with, um, all flavors of Validine, all flavors of Ouster, um, kind of pre-built for you out of the box. Uh, and, and then in terms of modifying them, uh, most of the inputs to the sensor simulation are in, in, J, in JSON files. So if you're familiar with JSON format, all of the things like the scan pattern or the, you know, the sort of broad level, uh, the range, those kind of things are accessible through that JSON input. So you can sort of customize LiDAR and camera and the radar sensor, even the IMU sensors through the JSON file. So it's pretty customizable in terms of creating a new sensor and modifying parameters and things like that. Um, so hopefully that answers that, that question, but if not, uh, let me know. And then Bomber says, what are the similar, similarities and differences between Chrono uh, and, and Mav? So as I mentioned, you know, um, uh, I am, I'm, a, I'm a Chrono user, I'm a, I'm a Chrono fan, um, and, uh, and so I'm pretty familiar with, with Chrono. Um, I would say that the biggest, uh, probably the biggest difference is that um, the – the sensor physics um, in MAVs is a little bit more uh, high fidelity in terms of the ray tracing engine. I didn't really get into this, but what MAVs uses the Embry ray tracing kernel, um, which is a, a, a scientific visualization tool, basically. Um, and it allows you to customize the physics that you want to embed on the rays. And so um, the, the 
the, the sensor simulations in Chrono actually have, have gotten pretty good, and I'm sort of tracking that. So there, there are certainly sensor simulations that are available to you in Chrono. I, I think that what's in Mavs still has a little bit more in terms of physics, and it certainly allows you to embed more just in terms of the, the underlying tool that's being used. Um, and then I would also say that I think that, at least right now, uh, Mavs is a little bit easier to, for some, somebody like a student to get spun up and using in, you know, basically an hour, you can you can have maps installed and be running your first autonomy simulation w with it connected to Ross if you wanted to. And uh, so it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, they do have similar capabilities. Of course, Chrono does have much more. Um, it's a bigger tool, right? It has a lot more, you know, maps doesn't do discrete element modeling or finite element modeling or any of these things that Chrono can do. So that's part of the reason that it's faster to install is it just does less. So it just gets, just gets back to what, what it is that you're wanting to do and what your priorities are. But there, a lot of ways they do similar things. Um, has anyone controlled the environment temperature and heat transfer in the vehicle mo in modeling high temperature situations? No, we have not. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and we, we have not really got into, into that at all. We have done some thermal, um, Camera, we can we can do thermal camera simulations in Mavs, but like a lot of uh, of simulation engines, basically we we the, the thermal signature is applied as a texture, and so the assumption is that texture is going to come from some third party tool, whatever it is that you want to use to to generate your thermal signatures, um, and then that will be pulled in an appropriate thermal band so that you can do the visualization of that thermal camera in Mavs. Good question though. Okay. Uh, we have probably another question coming in, but I also have, I guess, a question, and I guess it's it's not something specific, but also kind of something like I want to know what your views on this is, I guess. So it's kind of like a futuristic topic. But sometimes when we're trying to simulate something, um, I mean, of course, we cannot achieve what testing does in reality, and there's going to be a lot of differences, and there are going to be a lot of errors Sometimes it, it can be the smallest of smallest things, like, I don't know, vibrations coming from the engine revving and things like that. Mm -hmm. you're, you won't be able to pick it up easily. And I don't have no idea. I mean, I know if we really want to, we can go to that nth extent and model it. But there's always going to be something that I guess we miss. And I guess right. as modelers, we always get that question as to what we're going to do. And, and things like that. How how are we going to you know put in errors into the system? And you know are we going to use that you know for the simulations and understand something? So I guess I just want to know what your viewpoint on something like this is when you get asked something like that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And um and it is funny. I, I was talking with uh, some collaborators just yesterday that that work in this field, and we were you know we were sort of joking about that. You know, you always get the question about what your model doesn't do, right? And that, yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> so I think it's really important, um, number one, to, to understand when it, especially when it comes to autonomy, I, I think this is true for any simulation in general, but especially autonomy. Um, you have to, you have to ask the right questions of your simulator. Yeah. And right. And that that requires understanding the limitations of your simulator. So I've always tried to be very upfront about yeah. uh, what Mavs can and can't do and what it what it uh, you know is good at and what it's not good at, because I figure you're just going to figure that out anyway. But <laughs> it, it's it's um, it's really important when you're using a simulator, to understand what it what it can and can't do. And so if you know your simulator, for example, you know, doesn't do, uh, you know, soft soil. Um, you know, very well. Yeah. Which maps do, my maps does do soft soil pretty well, but let's say yours doesn't. Well, don't ask it to ask it those kind of questions. Right. So right. It, it's uh, that that part of it is really important. And then I also think and, and this is where the autonomy specific part of the question comes in. I really think that testing autonomy is, is very different from from mobility testing. It's mm -hmm. very different from from vehicle dynamics testing. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 it's, it, because of the level of software that's involved and, and to a certain extent, now that basically machine learning and neural networks sort of touch everything in that software stack, there's a non-determinism, yeah. uh, sort of a non-determinism that's involved where 
you really can't expect in a field test, if, and we found this in our field test, um, uh-huh. you can't expect to go out and get the same answer every time. You just Sometimes your vehicle does something weird and you don't know why, even though you thought you set up the test exactly the same. Yeah. So, um, so when it comes to autonomous vehicles, you need to account for that in your testing. And, and, uh, I, I think that that, in that way, the, the use of simulation in autonomous vehicles, if you understand the limitations of your simulation, if you understand mm-hmm. the right questions to ask with an autonomous vehicle can give you a lot of insight into what your vehicle is going to do when you go out into the field. Um, right. even if you know, you know, that, that it's not necessarily one to one. Um, and, and I always, I always put it, just say it like this. Uh, if, it, you know, if you think about, um, a typical, like driving video game, right? Um, uh-huh. even going back to the, you know, the old arcade games where you would sit down in the little thing and drive. Um, uh-huh. you, sure, there's some differences, but at the same time, you can watch a person use one of those and sort of understand this person's a very aggressive driver. This person, <laughs> you know, is a, Right. You can understand some things about how that driver thinks about right, uh, right. driving, yeah. even if the simulator is, is quite different. And that's really what our goal is with autonomy simulations. We want to understand our autonomous system as much as we can with the right. simulator, because the you know, the other thing that I always say is that the lessons learned from the simulator are easy. The lessons learned in the field are hard. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So. So you want to learn as much as you can from the simulator. Um, understanding the limitations and then go from there. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I see from uh, Mr. Zong, uh, what models does Maz use for off-road tire terrain interaction? So I mentioned uh, the, the the drove database equations. So there's there's um, uh, papers published out there for the drove database. I think up to 2.0 now. Uh, Dr. Mason could correct me if I'm wrong on that, but the, they're they're equations for soft uh, for excuse me for fine grained and coarse grain soil, and those are the those are the models that Mavs uses for, for offer attack terrain interaction. Good question. I guess I guess those are the questions we got. Um, yeah, there there were a lot of questions, and I guess there were a very good questions. You you answered them really well. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm gonna invite Dr. Bovmir back now. <laughs> Thank you. I, this presentation made it definitely incited a lot of interest. Thank you. So uh, next, uh, Varsha is going to show a few slides that might be useful for you. Uh, first of all, if you are interested in uh, terra mechanics research and you want to be part of this community, we invite you to join ISTVS. You will be warmly welcome, and uh, there is a link for you to sign up. Uh, next, uh, we have a uh, ISTVS conference upcoming in Yokohama, Japan at the end of October. And uh, also mm, remember that ISTVS talks are recorded and posted on ISTVS YouTube channel. We already covered many interesting topics and you can find them all on YouTube. Now we will mention Next uh, ISTVS talk, and this one will be given by Dr. Zainabel Sai from Ontario Tech University in Canada. And the topic of the talk will be influence of sand moisture content on track tire performance. Okay, so I guess those are the only ISTVS announcements that we have on our side. Um, we thank everybody for joining us for this session. This session will be made available on YouTube by the end of today, um, hopefully, if I can get to it. Uh, but uh, join me as we thank our host for today, Dr. Bomir Jelinek, and also uh, a big round of applause to Dr. Christopher Gooden, of course. He's done a lot of work. I think it was really interesting work to see. Um, I think the, the conversations that we had towards the end was, were really good. It was very interactive. It was really nice to uh, listen to all of this from, from you and know your opinions on these uh, things, Dr. Gooden. So um, I guess that's all we have for today. Uh, stay tuned for more sessions like these. And I hope everybody has a very good day, good night, or from wherever you're at. Good evening. <laughs>
thank you. And I guess that's it.